Mark, welcome to the California Blood Bank Society annual meeting, dude. Hooray, I can feel the heat warming me up already. It's <laughs> wonderful to get out of the snow, the rain. It's, it's miserable in the Northeast. I'm so happy to be in California <laughs> in my mind. In your mind, yes. And also, welcome Isn't back Isn't that how the song the... went? In my mind, I'm going to California, I think so. It might have been like Carolina, that. but that's, uh, I, who, who am Into I to quibble? Sea. You know, it's James Taylor, so that's that's all good. Um, and also, <laughs> welcome back to the Blood Bank Guy Essentials podcast. This is a dual thing. Two birds, one stone. Yep, yeah. very efficient. Uh, that's, that's what exactly I would expect from you, Joe. right. <laughs> well, thanks, Mark. I appreciate that. So way back in 2017, um, you and I got together and did a podcast, and that was uh, everyone that's at bbguy.org slash 040 um, that I called Holy Whole Blood with a, a nice little DC comics reference there. And Mark, I don't know if you, I don't know if I've told you this, but over 5,000 people around the world have listened to that particular episode. And I'm sorry. I'm very, very sorry. But uh, <laughs> 4,999 of those are my mom. <laughs> and and mine might have been the other if, if my stepmom might have been the other anyway but uh we we covered a lot when we talked about that in 2017 it's been almost four years obviously i can do math and i want to catch up with you a little bit not just on low titer oh whole blood but also on some of the some of the new and exciting stuff that's coming out and that you're deeply involved in um and get a little bit more data perhaps than we were than we had available to us back then but I want to start at the beginning, Mark. I want to start at the beginning. And there's something that I want to dispel because I keep hearing this. People keep asking me this. And, and I know this is something that's near and dear to your heart. The, the way that this gets phrased to me often is I look in my textbooks and I look online at teaching materials and stuff like that. And I see people saying that the initial resuscitation fluid for trauma should be crystalloids. And why are we talking about plasma? Why are we talking about low titer O whole blood? What's the deal? So, so you've got the floor for two minutes, Mark. Not, just can you knock that out for us? Yeah, well, I think you're reading an old textbook because the new textbooks <laughs> would say, "Don't, don't do that, man. We, we were wrong. We had it wrong." You know, it made a lot of sense, right? I mean, crystalloids mm -hmm. are dirt cheap. They come in a plastic bag. They don't transmit any diseases. And you know, if you're clever enough to be able to figure out which one is the ringers, which is the 5% dextrose and the normal saline, it's not easy, yeah. uh, you know, then you can transport it easily. And if it breaks in the ambulance, it's water, who cares? It's not mm -hmm. like you have a blood product that's spilled all over the back. And so the thought was, if you could keep the blood pressure up um, using, using crystalloid, then, then the fairly large reserve of red cell and, uh, and coagulation factors would get where they have to go uh, and, and you could sustain the patient until they could get to, to definitive care. But we've come 180 degrees from that. We don't want to have a high blood pressure, high normal blood pressure anymore. Mm -hmm. We want a permissive hypotension, right? So we don't need to keep the blood pressure up. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and if you look at the constituents of normal saline, there's nothing normal about it. It's like, <laughs> it's a misnomer, right? You know, it's like uh, Maple Leafs, good hockey team, complete misnomer. It just doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. Um, there's nothing normal about it. And if you have some kidney damage from your trauma or pre-existing, it's even less normal, yeah. right? It's like the Boston Bruins, even less normal than the Maple Leafs. And, and it just doesn't make uh, uh, any sense to be giving people stuff that's acidotic, mm -hmm. that does not um, help to transport oxygen. It doesn't help to... Uh, uh, heal uh, to, 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 to do hemostasis. Mm -hmm. None of that. Saline doesn't do any of that stuff. Yeah. And yet they would give it in liter quantities, lots and right. lots of it, because it didn't transmit diseases. And I think, frankly, that's what people were, were afraid of. Yeah. Uh, now we know with great evidence, in fact, we've had evidence for, for 30 years, the Bickle study uh, in New England, I think, uh, showed the patients who had uh, uh, delayed fluid resuscitation, in other words, who weren't blasted with saline from the minute they were picked up in the street till the time they hit the emergency room in the OR, did better, had longer survival than patients who had um, who had a lot of saline administered in those in those three parts of the, of the resuscitation. And many other studies have shown the same thing. So, right. crystalloids is passe. Yeah. It uh, it's convenient, but it doesn't do your patient any favors. Okay. 
Well, so I, and I, I'm right there with you. And that's uh, I, the thing I hear repeatedly from from trauma surgeons is I, I, I don't want clear stuff. I mean, to simplify it as much as possible, I, give me stuff that's not clear. Avoid that yeah, as much as you right. can. I'm sure you hear the same thing all the time. Yeah. And finally, that's great to hear because that's yeah. that's what's going to be better for the patient. We have so much data that we didn't have back then. Right. You have blood products that are safer than they were back then. Mm -hmm. And we have an enhanced understanding of, of what happens from a endothelial, from a coagulopathy mm -hmm. uh, and a bleeding perspective in patients who are in trauma and, and clear stuff doesn't take any of the boxes. Yeah. Well, so with that being said, let's, let's take a step up. So we, we, we don't want the clear stuff. I think we got that. What about the yellow stuff? I mean, so I, there's been a lot of discussion and you've contributed to that discussion a lot over the, over the years on using plasma and perhaps using plasma early, perhaps using plasma in ways that we hadn't thought of before, kind of quote unquote, breaking some of the ABO rules that we've talked about before. So, so let's, let's just get a quick overview of that. What do we know now about giving plasma early to patients? Uh, you know, uh, I was on a, a phone call with um, a bunch of army surgeons, and uh, one of them called it liquid Jesus. And uh, when I realized that half of the army surgeons were Israeli, I came on and said, maybe we should call it the liquid Abraham. <laughs> so um, that's really what what we're talking about. Um, you know, uh, uh, you're, you're, you're probably talking about the, the Pamper study sure. where we looked at patients who were traumatically injured as if there's any other way to be injured mm -hmm. and transported to, to the hospital by helicopter. It took 40 minutes to get there. They were seriously injured. They had high mortality rates in the end. A lot of them needed a massive transfusion. These patients um, were supplement were randomized to be supplemented with two units of whole of, 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 of plasma could be a or a B plasma mm -hmm. versus whatever the standard of care was. So the plasma was added on to the standard of care and we showed better mortality improvement in mortality. Uh, at 30 days. That was the FDA's um, favorite endpoint for bleeding studies back then. But if you look on the curves, they start to separate around three hours, which is a much more relevant uh, endpoint for, for a bleeding study. So, so the high level uh, conclusion of Pamper was that if you're going to, if it's going to take you a while to get to the hospital more than 20 minutes and you're seriously injured, uh, then plasma is going to help to to save uh, the day, and we've refined that with sub with, with secondary analyses to show that this is basically uh, um, most efficacious for blunt injuries mm -hmm. and for patients with traumatic brain injury. Okay. In fact, Jason Sperry and his group have done some really cool stuff with um, um, uh, blanking on the word, but it's it's the the, the pattern of expression of inflammatory markers. Mm. Um, and he's shown that there's a very specific pattern, patients who, when they're injured, if they produce this particular pattern of inflammatory markers are the ones that benefit the most from plasma transfusion. So he's done a really good job of breaking out exactly who is responsible or who is going to benefit from it. Mm -hmm. But because it's hard to tell, you know, what markers are elevated in, in a patient you've just scooped up. Yeah. Uh, if, the tra if the transport time is long and they're seriously injured, then two units is, is very helpful. Okay. So with that being said, Mark, um, getting perhaps getting plasma to to trauma to patients that have undergone trauma early, as early as possible might make a difference but one of the logistical challenges of that that we've dealt with for years is that we've lived with the dogma for literally decades that the only plasma that you can use in those settings is av plasma um, and again, I know you've been involved in in some somewhat groundbreaking publications, especially the STAT study that was published in, in 2017, I believe. And I've talked about that at length with Nancy Dunbar on yeah. episode uh, 36 of this podcast. So everybody, bbguide.org slash 036 for all the full details. But Mark, can you summarize what what was found in the STAT study um, and further what what data do you have since then to either support or refute what you found? Yeah, and full credit to Nancy for the status study. She did a, an amazing job with it. I was just there. Um, but um, <laughs> that's half the battle, we Mark. Uh, well, I think it was about 5% of the okay. battle and she okay, did the enough. other 95. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, this is we did this with the best uh, research collaborative. We asked the question, excluding group O people, uh, for all where, where plasma will be compatible for everyone, no matter mm -hmm. what group you give, um, do patients who get incompatible plasma units in the form of plasma um, uh, do, do better than patients who get incompatible plasma? So we looked at injured group A people versus B uh, and AB, people mm -hmm. who received at least one unit of, uh, of group A plasma. Didn't have to be low titer. 
a group A could have been just you know any any uh, type of group A plasma. Uh, and what we found at the very highest level was there was no difference in mortality, in early mortality, in hospital mortality. We didn't find any differences in in secondary outcomes as well. Mm -hmm. um, so what that what that gave us confidence was that uh, at least at, at a high level. Group A plasma, which is so much more available than AB, right? I mean, if we had an unlimited supply of AB plasma, yeah. we wouldn't be having this discussion, sure. right? And so there is a risk. Yeah, you, there is a risk in theory when you mm -hmm. transfuse uh, group A plasma to someone whose blood type you don't know. Most mm -hmm. of the time, of course, they're going to be O or A. That's 85% or more. Right. So, you know, you get pretty good odds that it's going to be compatible, but it's not everyone. Mm -hmm. And and we have to look out for those other people as well, the Bs and the ABs. And clearly at, at the high level, we're not causing any harm. You know, maybe there's some hemolysis that's happening, uh, but it's not translating into into mortality, which is really what we care about. And so we recently redid the study under the code name Mengo after the champions of the Brazilian domestic soccer league, my team. And uh, and what we showed in Mengo was basically what we showed in STAT. We looked at all patients, uh, all, all, all the blood types. We didn't include the group O's. Uh, and we looked at all sources of plasma, including the little bit that comes in a red cell and the little bit that comes in cryo. And we asked the question, simply put, do patients who get uh, compatible plasma, so group O's, or patients who get identical plasma, so like an A person who gets only A uh, plasma products, do they do better than patients who get incompatible plasma? And we looked at, uh, uh, what it was, it was a one hour, six hour, 24 hour mortality, and we showed no difference, not even close to, to any difference uh, uh, amongst the patients who received uh, compatible versus at least one unit uh, of, of incompatible plasma. And the average or, or the, I guess, the median quantity of incompatible plasma in that study, I think, was about 350 mLs. So we're almost at about two units of, of plasma. So it's quite similar to what we were doing in Pamper. And it reflects the real life practice mm -hmm. of, of how much incompatible plasma uh, patients are, are getting, at least from the sites that participated. So it wasn't all that much. Um, and, uh, and, and we didn't see any evidence of, uh, of, of, of death. We didn't look for hemolysis. We didn't look for any of that. We just looked at death and we didn't find anything. Okay. Okay. But, you know, well, uh, uh, speaking of hemolysis, um, yeah. just briefly, you know, we, we, we've been looking at our whole blood uh, uh, utilization and, and uh -huh. what happens to patients in trauma who get whole blood. Mm -hmm. And here we're looking for hemolysis. We're looking for LDH, bilirubin, haploglobin. Right. Uh, and we've seen no difference mm -hmm. in patients who get at least four units of whole blood with a titer of 100. That's our new titer. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, no difference between the O's and the non-O recipients. So at that level, no no adverse event, no hemolysis. And at the high level, we're not seeing any mortality difference at all. Okay. So it confirms the practice. So Mark, and, and that's that's a great that's a great summary. And I think that I think that we're starting to see that in in my world in Southern California and blood centers, we're starting to see that becoming I mean, it's just pretty much standard. The the use of the use of group O, excuse me, the group of use of group A plasma as the you know the, the initial plasma resuscitation anyway. Uh, but you know, I also Joe, just to uh, tell yeah, you about a new study that, that that's online early. We we surveyed 103 level one trauma centers, uh -huh. level one American trauma centers, and I think 95 percent of them use group A plasma in their initial resuscitation. Yeah. And I can't remember what it was. Maybe it was 10%, mm -hmm. uh, only 10% actually tighter at the plasma. So right. uh, it's uh, the wild, wild Southwest. <laughs> I like it. But it's fine. I mean, it's, uh, this is what we're doing. The practice yeah. is, is, uh, is very consistent with all the safety data that we're getting. So mm -hmm. not all of it is low tighter. And luckily the saline's being kicked in a touch or made into popsicles or whatever they do with it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Saline popsicles. That sounds really disgusting. Delish. I got to tell you. Oh man. <laughs> oh, for post-op patients. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. So, so with that being said, we, we need to, we need to wander back into, uh, to low titer O whole blood, because obviously that to me is kind of the next step. And that's, um, again, just speaking from my personal recent experience, um, we, we have several hospitals here in Southern California that, that my blood center serves. And there are, I don't serve all the hospitals here, nor do I serve all the level one trauma centers in Southern California. But there is a growing interest and, and we are supplying it. My center is supplying it. Um, and what I hear mostly from people is how can we get more? Um, so it's, right. so, so that's, I think in the, I think it's pretty safe to say, and I tell people in hospital blood bags this all the time, 
I think the question is mostly settled in the minds of trauma surgeons. Uh, I, if mostly, just in general, I don't, obviously there, there's, there's more work to do and you're in process of doing that. But I think a lot of, tra to a lot of trauma surgeons, it's like, great. They've been wanting whole blood for years. Super wonderful. Let's rock and roll. But what I want to talk to you about, Mark, but before we, before we get to some other really important stuff about our age is just go back for us for just a second. And I, I wonder if you would mind just summarizing in your mind, um, the benefits of using low titer O whole blood, as opposed to using component therapy, the traditional uh, quote unquote, one to one to one or one to two to one to one, whatever, as opposed to that, what do you see as the general high level benefits of using low titer O whole blood? You know, I, I would encourage all of the uh, junior uh, colleagues who are on uh, watching this or listening to go to a trauma resuscitation, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, like we get patients in the blood bank, we send the products down, there's a heightened sense of, of anxiety in the blood bank. But yes. imagine what it's like in the trauma bay, go and just be a wallflower and watch it. And you will see organized pandemonium, right? And you'll see lines going in and blood products flying all around and people pushing on the chat. I mean, I mean, yes. it, it, it's, it's a symphony of, 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 of coordinated action and anything we can do in the blood bank to help those guys uh, resuscitate patients and to make their life easier. I think we ought to be doing and, mm -hmm. and, and giving whole blood guarantees that they're going to get about the patient's going to get balanced resuscitation early. So you don't end up in a situation where they've given 10 red cells, you know, and meanwhile, someone's telling about the blood pressure, they forget about the platelets, and they don't get any platelets and they get two units of plasma and it's totally imbalanced. And, and that's not what the patient needs. The evidence all suggests that some form of early balanced resuscitation uh, uh, is really important until you can get uh, more specific information about what the patient's lacking. So if, if it makes the surgeon's life easier, hmm. They're going to yell at us less, which would be mm -hmm. great. That's they might thing. remember to send us a pre-transfusion sample early. That would be super. <laughs> right. You know, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's going to make their life easier, which, made, which probably makes things better for the patient. So if we simplify the logistics of the resuscitation uh, with, with easy, balanced resuscitation in one bag that's not much bigger than a red cell, uh, that can go in a blood warmer, uh, that can be administered quickly if necessary, um, that, that's, that, that's great. You know, there are other benefits, uh, fewer donor exposures, um, mm -hmm. there's less, uh, uh, well, there isn't any additive solution in it. So there's fewer, right. there's less of this sort of uh, crystalloid like stuff that's just going to end up in the third space anyway, just like the saline, right? It doesn't stay intravascular. Most of it doesn't. Mm -hmm. so, so, so there's less of that. You get the cold platelets and the, the evidence that we're accumulating is showing us the cold platelets primed for coagulation activity. Um, you don't get those uh, uh, in room temperature platelets. Right. Um, so you get a dose of, uh, of those. And, and even if you use a, a leukoreduction reduction filter, you're still getting a very significant quantity of platelets. So, so I think those are some of the main high level benefits. We're, we're, what we're lacking and sort of the, the notion that the, the question is answered is does it do uh, anything for the patient? Is there a better outcome for the patient? Uh, I'll just interview myself, Joe. So, Go ahead. Uh, yeah. I'll just, is, uh, Mark, I'll just is there any back. benefit to the patient of getting uh, uh, the whole blood? <laughs> And the answer is, well, probably, um, and this is, this is what the literature is starting to show. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, we don't have the randomized trials like we do for plasma or for um, you know, hemoglobin thresholds. You know, we, we have great trials for those because whole blood's a new thing. And there are randomized trials that are coming. We have a pilot trial that we finished in Pittsburgh. Uh, the Lights Military Network has commissioned a study. Phil Spinella's got a, a study in cardiac surgery patients. You know, I mean, it, it's coming. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, we know we have to study it. We know we can't make definitive conclusions about its, its efficacy now. Safety, probably, yes, based on our retrospective data. But the efficacy is coming. And what we're seeing are a lot of retrospective studies. And the way I can summarize them is that the patients certainly don't do worse if they get whole blood than if they get components. You know, um, uh, recently a, a retrospective study from uh, a single center study came out that showed some benefits of, uh, of whole blood to the patient, <clears throat> fewer transfusions, uh, shorter mm -hmm. length of stay. Uh, another study that looked at uh, the, um, the TQIP database um, uh, found that although the patients were getting a median of like one unit, there was significant improvements in, in, in uh, mortality reductions in uh, complications. Mm -hmm. It's hard to think that one unit 
uh, could be responsible for all of that, but at least yeah. the patients aren't doing worse. You know, we just published uh, uh, a, a matched uh, a propensity matched trial study retrospective where we looked at um, trauma patients who were resuscitated with whole blood versus components. And we looked for DVTs, for infections, mm -hmm. renal function, excuse me. We couldn't find any differences. And the trends that were there uh, we're all in the favor of, of whole blood. So, mm -hmm. so certainly what we're seeing is that it's a safe thing to do from a hemolytic perspective. Patients don't hemolyze when they're getting it. And two, the outcomes are certainly not worse. And just one, one word about, uh, about hemolysis, you know, here's the thing, right? So LDH, bilirubin, and haptoglobin change yeah. in a trauma patient, and they right. change in exactly the same way that they would in somebody who's having hemolysis. Yep. So, it's difficult to measure, to, to look at any one patient and say, well, is this bilirubin through the roof because of the trauma or mm -hmm. because of the hemolysis? Mm -hmm. uh, or is the shock liver causing the hypo, the, the haptoglobin to, to be low? And, and, and so you can't really tell, but you can look at large groups of patients like we've done, like other groups have done, and you just don't see differences, even in trends in, in these biochemical markers between the O's and the non-O's. So I, I, I think I think it's for, for, for modest quantities of transfusions like we've been doing, uh, four, six, eight units mm -hmm. with a titer of less than 100, I, I, I'm very confident that, that the safety question is um, in the bag. The efficacy question, we need the randomized trials to show us that. Okay. Well, so you, you took away several of my questions. Oh, by the way, is it okay if I talk? Is that okay? Is it, do you mind? I'm kidding. Oh, do you have anything to add to what I've said? Go ahead. <laughs> that was, you were on a roll, buddy. I didn't, I didn't want to get in the way. That was fantastic. Um, and, and it was. So there are a couple of practical questions that people ask about low titer or whole blood that I, that I want to make sure that we cover. And, and the, the first of those is, in your mind and in the way that you see this going forward, is this an initial resuscitation or is this an ongoing thing? In other words, and you mentioned just a second ago, there's kind of a there's kind of an outer limit of for for how many that you use. And in, and to be clear, uh, standards ABB standards requires that centers set a limit of of how much incompatible plasma, for example, people get. So so there has to be something that people are doing. But how do you how do you transition, Mark? I guess is the question from the low titer or whole blood to whatever. So uh, to, to be really clear, the, the, the standard requires that the hospital sets the maximum amount of whole blood units that a patient can receive. Mm -hmm. You can set that maximum amount to infinity. You just have to have a policy. <laughs> right. Right. You take everything That's on the true. shelf. That's true. That, is a, that, that would be completely consistent with the policy, mm -hmm. just like incompatible plasma. You just have to have a policy for how you're going to deal with it. Mm -hmm. The standards correctly don't specify a quantity of whole blood that a patient can receive. The hospital just has to have it in writing uh, what they're going to do. So okay. anything that the hospital comes up with will satisfy that policy. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of them, some, pol some policies might be better than others, um, but, uh, and that's for, for anything, but uh, right. there is, the, the standards don't dictate the maximum uh, because they're, they're, they're not meant to do that. And, you know, in terms of the transition from whole blood to components, I think that's going to depend on the patient and the extent of the monitoring that's happening. You know, mm -hmm. if, if you're at a center that has, uh, turn, you know, that has uh, near patient testing like thrombolastogram, uh, and you're able to get, uh, you know, MA back, maybe the patient needs more platelets to supplement mm -hmm. uh, what they're what they're receiving, maybe the patient, you know, needs more plasma, I think when you start getting a sense of is the bleeding slowing down? Is there a particular defect that we can correct using components? That's the time to start using a more tailor-made approach to the resuscitation. But at the beginning, when you don't have any of this back and they're just bleeding from everywhere, right. whole blood's the best because it's one bag, you get balanced resuscitation. Yep. Okay, and, and that's fair. But I guess what I'm going for at, at least as much is, well, first, let me devil's advocate for just a second. I, you're 100% right that according to the way the standard is written, if you set your limited infinity, that would that would meet the standard. I might argue that that doesn't necessarily meet the the heart of the standard or the perhaps the intent of the standard. Uh, I mean, I, and, and again, I I don't I don't want to get into a battle with you on this because although it would be fun, we could drop the gloves and go, Mark. I, let's do that. But um, whatever. I, I I mean, the the fact for me is that that it seems to me like the intent of this of the standard saying you need to set a limit is to try and figure out what that limit might be rather than be infinity. 
but I hear what you're saying and you're right that there's that 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 is the way the standard reads so again don't want to argue about that but you know, what as about many this? world leaders have pointed out, you can't go to jail for breaking the spirit of the law. <laughs> That's a good point. You're not wrong there. You are absolutely not wrong. I, I would and, agree. And, 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 and I agree. I agree with you, Joe. Um, I agree with you that in the beginning, when those standards came out, virtually mm -hmm. nobody was using whole blood. And right. it was new and it was potentially threatening because the cold platelets could be causing clots everywhere because right. of the incompatible plasma. Mm -hmm. So I think there was correct. You, what you said is right. The, the, the intention was to start off in a, in a sort of really modest way. We started with two units mm -hmm. um, and then work our way up uh, in terms of dosing as the safety has been demonstrated. And I think that's actually what's happened. I think mm -hmm. people started. Uh, modestly, those right. of us who didn't have uh, army experience, military experience, and didn't have experience using it, yeah, didn't know. And so we started mm -hmm. very slowly. And others were pushing us because they'd been there in battle zones and they'd already given 20 units of it. Sure. And they know it's safe. Yeah. Uh, and so I think what we've now arrived at is the point where, oops, where the uh, data is. My computer just turned off. There we go. <laughs> where the data is coming to meet the experience of the people that were doing it and knew it was right because they'd done it. Uh, but now we have data to prove that what they were doing was, was right and safe the whole time. Okay, fair enough. Um, so, but back back to what I was trying to ask before I got distracted by the, you know, dropping the gloves thing. Um, patient comes in, they're, we're, we're resuscitating them aggressively with low titer O whole blood. We get that pre-sample back, which our, which our uh, ER is kind enough to draw very early in the process. And we're very happy. We, we discover the patients, the patients group B. Um, that's my question. At what point, when you get that information, now I'm assuming it's time to give the patient to switch over to giving the patient group B. Is that correct? Or do you advocate or it, are places considering continuing with whole blood in those settings? Well, again, I think it depends on what's happening. If the patient is continuing to have an active, unstoppable bleed, mm -hmm. then I, I'd continue with the whole blood and the balanced okay. resuscitation. Uh, you know, uh, I, I think if the bleeding is slowing down or if you've identified a specific solitary defect, like they're really hypofibrinogenemic, uh, then, mm -hmm. you know, whole blood, which has everything in it, isn't going to correct it as quickly as, as some cryo or, or some pharmaceutical will. So right. I, I think really the, the, the key is how badly is the patient bleeding? Yeah. What control do we have? And what do we know about the coagulation defect? And if we don't know anything, then I would just continue using whole blood. Okay, so I guess the bottom line is it it's there's probably not a there's probably not a universal thing a universal rule. It's going to be patient specific. It's going to be situation specific. In other words, look, you know, uh, <laughs> eat all you want means eat everything you want, not eat all that you can, right? You, there's, you don't have to give the maximum number of units, right? right. There, there, there is something between zero and infinity, which is what the patient's going to need. So, you know, so uh, yeah, I don't think, I mean, if your hospital has a limit of 50 units, you don't have to give 50. Um, mm -hmm. But, but I think, I think hospitals um, should have a sense of the safety of, of the, of the whole blood and, and, and can, can, can implement policies that are consistent with their own comfort level at this point. Right. Okay. Well, so Mark, since our time is is uh, getting a little short, there is there is something that I think we need to talk about, which I think is really important. Um, as you know, when when low titer O whole blood became a thing, and when standards was was modified to uh, to allow the use of it, I, I I remember I remember talking to you when that happened because it was not long after we had done our episode, if I remember right. Um, as you know, there were some people that said, um, some some really smart people that said, it's too soon. Why are we putting this in standards? We don't have enough data. It's, we're concerned about this, et cetera. And, and I'm not here to rehash those arguments. That's not the point. But my my point is that not long after that, well, a couple of years after that, you, uh, you were lead author on an article that kind of blew some minds again and <laughs> raised some concerns. Um, as we talked about, low titer O whole blood. Um, well, actually, we didn't mention this, but as we talked about in the the last time we discussed this, low titer O whole, whole blood for most places is O positive. Most blood centers make it as O positive. Uh, a few places are making O neg, um, but most places are making O pos. And because it's O pos, it tends not to be used for childbearing age females on the, on the the off chance that they would be Rh negative. 
and that they would induce anti-D and cause problems with pregnancy in the future. So you published this article in 2019 in Transfusion. Everyone, I'll put this on the, the website. Um, your, the, the name of the article is, it's time to reconsider the risks of transfusing RHD negative females of childbearing potential with RHD positive red cells in bleeding emergencies. And uh, I'm guessing you've gotten some feedback on this article, Mark, and some, some discussions on it. So why don't you, uh, again, we don't have a ton of time, but what's your basic thesis with this? And, and, uh, and what do you think moving forward we need to be thinking about in regards to this? There's a, there were a few things that uh, blew my mind that I felt, if, if they're blowing my mind, probably others as well. And, 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 and primarily, it was an article I read that showed that yeah, from the Dutch group, because they're the best for HDFN studies, they show that even in women who are uh, sensitized to anti-D and are carrying a D-positive fetus, the rate of fetal demise is 4%. Mm -hmm. And that, that blew me away. I thought it was still uh, you know, in, the, in the 40s or 50% yeah. like it was before high-resolution ultrasound came along. And it got me to thinking about all the different things that have to happen to a woman from the time that she's uh, a D-negative woman, from the time she's transfused during her trauma resuscitation until the HDFN outcome. Mm -hmm. And we identified a few... Uh, important things like surviving the trauma, uh, making anti-D, and the de-aluminization rate could fill a whole other uh, podcast. Sure. It ranges in trauma from about 8 to 40% mm. uh, in, in, in different studies with the same methodology. So we picked an, an intermediate 20%. Uh, she's got to get pregnant. She has to carry a deposited baby. We, we calculated about a 0.3% risk of fetal death from the woman receiving uh, an Rh-positive uh, red cell unit. Okay. Uh, if you include other factors like um, how how many pregnancies she's likely to have, when is like when in her life does she have the pregnancies, um, mm -hmm. other societal things, how many partners is she going to have, the risk goes up slightly, and it depends on the age of the patient as well. Because the younger the patient is, the longer the pregnancy horizon will be, mm -hmm. so the longer the potential. But you know, generally, if you're looking at at, at 18, 19 year olds, you're looking at about a five percent. Uh, fetal, like any, any type of HDFN, and it drops mm -hmm. to about zero after 40%. Okay. So what this told us was that it's not a death sentence for, mm -hmm. for the future fetus if mom gets a deep positive red cell. We know that pre-hospital transfusions save lives. There's, there's lots of military and right. civilian data to show that. And we just can't put RH negative products where we'd like them to be. It's yeah. like AB plasma. We don't have enough. Mm -hmm. So is there, is, what, what can we do to, to, to improve the care of women of childbearing age who are injured uh, and need a transfusion before they can get to the hospital where RH negative products might be available. RH positive products, including whole blood, carry with them a very low risk of a fetal uh, adverse event, in particular death, mm -hmm. uh, and a high risk of saving mom's life. So I think when you look at the absolute risk reductions that come from early transfusion, some studies have shown 14%. Uh, risk reduction uh, Sperry study where we did the secondary analysis and we showed that in the helicopter the patients who received plasma and red cells sounds a bit like whole blood <laughs> minus the platelets uh, had better outcomes than the patients who had any one component alone and certainly yeah. way better than patients who had just saline so I think that 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 w knowing what we know about how good our obstetrics colleagues are about diagnosing and managing HDFN uh, that, that women should not be denied life-saving transfusions in situations such as pre-hospital transfusions where RH negative products uh, aren't available. So has this led to a change in your practice, Mark? It has at, at all of our level one hospitals, adult level one hospitals, we, we transfuse RH positive whole blood to any patient, uh, any adult patient, uh, regardless of their uh, sex. So women and men uh, uh, of RH type negative or unknown as they often are in trauma, mm -hmm. will get RH positive products. We have a program in place where if the patient receives only one unit of RH positive products, we'll use ROGAM to, mm -hmm. well, WinRO to neutralize that unit. If she receives more than that, we feel that the extent of the hemolysis would be too severe. Yeah. Um, and so we, we uh, have an information sheet we give the, to the patient explaining why she received RH positive products. Mm -hmm. And there's a phone number for the high risk maternity clinic that they can call nice. if they'd like to have some consultation or advice uh, uh, either now or before the next pregnancy or or whenever. So we have a really good relationship with our obstetrical colleagues and they're really on board. In fact, the senior author on that paper is the doctor who does the intrauterine transfusions in Pittsburgh. Mm. And I was joking with him that maybe he's just trying to gin up some business for himself, <laughs> but he's not. He truly believes in, uh, in saving the saving mom's life so she can have another uh, a baby. And so yeah. he's very confident in, in their ability to, to rescue babies uh, uh, from, from HDFN. So, um, so I think that the, um, 
I, I think if you have a choice, obviously you would use an RH negative product sure. in a childbearing age woman if you don't know what her RH type is, but I would not withhold a transfusion if you don't. Okay. The one last thing, Mark, and, and we really are super short of time. I want to leave time for those on the CBBS meeting to, to, to pepper you with questions. Um, but what about using low titer O whole blood in kids uh, in the pediatric population? What do we know now that we didn't know four years ago? Well, again, it's safe. From a hemolytic perspective, we use up to 40 mils per kilo of RH negative whole blood in the kids because we haven't quite taken that step to RH positive whole blood in our kids. So, um, you know, we, 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 in the Thor supplement this year, we'll have a, an article showing the serological safety of transfusing up to 40 mils per kilo of whole blood, uh, serologically safe. And um, we were working on a propensity match analysis to, to see what the outcomes are um, between whole blood recipients and, uh, and component recipients. And the sneak peek is that they certainly, just like the adults, they don't do worse yeah. if you get whole blood. There, we didn't find any increased evidence of adverse reactions in the whole blood recipients. So for what that's worth from a small single center study, it's safe and there's no hemolysis. Awesome. Do it. Mark, you are the man, as always. I always appreciate our time. It's such a blast to talk to you, uh, fellow Good hockey job. fan and friend. So thank you so much for doing this, Mark. You bet. Go Habs. Make the Go playoffs. Don't lose to wings. the Leafs. <laughs> yeah. my, my team's not making the playoffs, dude. All right. I know what you mean. Take care, Mark. Good Have job. a great day. Bye. Thanks Bye. for inviting me to the meeting. Yeah, no problem.